And uh, to me, it, it's, it's always a fascinating thing because you look at literature or a document that's so many thousands of years old, so much older than the Bible. And in fact, you'll find that much of uh, what the Bible portrays to you has its roots in things such as the Bhagavad Gita, as well as uh, the ancient sutras and Vedas and so forth and so on that come from, from India and uh, God knows where else. But I think what the Bhagavad Gita instructs of each one of us and, and those of you who are watching is finally in this age to challenge yourself to a very important point in, in your life and in your experience. And that is a basic need <coughs> that the population of the earth has, which is to grow up. And, and, and to grow up means to start using the God-given intelligence that most of us have and start looking at things as they were intended and not creating stories. Um, I had somebody, when I came in to set up this morning, somebody's voice was on the TV, on the answering machine, and rebuking us in the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus covers you, and uh, you know, you got to be born again. And, all. And, and, and you could hear the strain and the stress and the, and the, and the you know, violence in the voice of that person. And so, regardless of how strongly they feel about their particular religious persuasion, they are betrayed by their own feelings that they are just so filled with violence and, and can't deal with anyone else not totally agreeing with their particular philosophy. And basically, even, even to the point, let me just show you something. Even to the point where, where this fellow was yelling over the phone, it's the blood of Jesus that saves you. Um, I, I wrote something down because it's, it's important if, if you do approach something like this and you want to approach it maturely and not from the point of emotion. Go to page 942 in, in the Bibles that you have there. There's little Bibles. Let me just show you something. And it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. And the Apostle Paul says, I say that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You know, that, and, and the first thing you have to do, if, if you're going to start to understand these things, as I said, is people have to start to mature, they have to grow up, they have to understand the meanings of symbolism, and in mysticism, the word blood means the inner power, the inner life force. And the inner, and the inner power and the inner life force can only be approached through meditation. There's no other way. You know, it's not a question of real blood. It has nothing to do with that. And that's what the Bible is trying to say specifically. There has nothing to If you notice in the very first next sentence after that, the Apostle Paul says, and corruption cannot inherit any corruption. The Apostle Paul did not believe that anyone could ever raise themselves out of a grave, including Jesus. Nobody. It's not possible. It was not meant to be that. Human bodies, once they hit the ground, that's the end of it. That's the end of the body. It's not the end of the person. The resurrection takes place in life while you were alive within yourself, rising up into the higher realms of consciousness, which is God consciousness, where then a difference can be made to the world. You see. Somebody climbing out of a grave, indeed, um, is a and it, it's, to me it's not a happy thought, it's also a very distressing thought. That's one of the things that Christians are waiting for. Everybody's going to get out of graves. Who wants it? Would you want to be around here for that? <laughs> I'm driving up Lacey Road or wherever. They have a Joan was telling me they have a cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> and they have a cemetery in Tom's River called Good Luck Cemetery. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> this is true. This is true. And uh, I really think we ought to change it to better luck next time, you know. know that. But um, you know, come on. It, this is what I mean about immaturity and not being willing to willing to grow up. You know, people, you know, Uncle Charlie, you know, you know died uh, with a bottle in his hand. Can you imagine this guy crawling out, you know, at about 3 o'clock? You know, who wants to be around for this great second coming? Forget this. So we understand that people coming out of the graves is just what's happening all over the world in the New Age, coming out of the graves of the lower mind and rising up into the air of the higher realms of consciousness, where a difference can be made to the world. That's why you haven't been back three minutes, and you're raising your hand and probably... Why don't you check it up, because uh, people don't want to see the back. Look at the pretty dress you have on. And stand up and come and do your reading. <laughs> sister, sister Ethel, as they say in all those other places. 
<laughs> oh, oh. Well, you, you're talking about meditation, but if you go into verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we, but we shall all be changed, which is very true. In a twinkling of an eye. Yeah, very yes, true. Exactly, and that's what's happening right now. So, so this is what we're talking about. And when you approach the Bhagavad Gita, then you have to approach it maturely as an adult person. And, and you have to look beyond the realms of, of word into the symbols of these words and start to realize just what life is all about. So let's, you got this little Bhagavad Gita sheet. For those of you who are out there in TV land, you always say, send me one of those. You got to send an envelope with a stamp on it. You know, it's getting to be a little too much. Let's read 88.1. It's page 88.1 in the little Bhagavad Gita. You can see the Hindu writing to the left. That's Sanskrit. And it says, all beings are Juna. Now, let me just show you something so that you know, because, you know, it's been a long time since we started this. This is basically what the Bhagavad Gita is about, okay? It's about you. And I'll make you one nice. Got ears. Not bad. Bow tie. Yeah. Little hair. All right. But this is what it's about, okay? Here's you have the left side of the brain, which is the intellectual side. And here you have the right hemisphere of the brain. I know it looks opposite from where you're at, okay? And in the Bhagavad Gita, the thoughts that come out of the left side are referred to as the sons of the blind king. The thoughts that come out of the right side, which is the divine aspect of thought, are called the sons of Pandu. And the ego, which is within you, which has to make the decision will you choose the left side or the right side, is known as Arjuna. In uh, the same way, the... Um, uh, the Bible that we read, it's known as Peter. Uh, it, it's just a name to describe that part of you which has to make a decision as to which side you go. So here in 88.1, Krishna is speaking and he says, All beings, O Arjuna, return at the close of every cosmic cycle into the realm of nature, which is part of, and this is a very big word that you want to keep in, me. Okay? The realm of nature, which is part of me. And at the beginning of the next, I send them forth again. Okay? Now, what's common sense, mature people, you don't need a Bible, you don't need um, a, a document of any age in order for you to see. You go outside, you take a look at the trees and the flowers. The trees and the flowers are getting a little old. Okay? They still look pretty good. But inside of them is kind of a movement of death starting to move. And inside of those trees is this movement, which in a very short time you'll start to see, as some of us turn gray, you'll start to see them turn a little yellow and orange and then red and so forth and so on. Okay? And then before you know it, that very same tree that is so filled with life and exuberance and just giving out oxygen and warmth will stand before you gray and barren and for all intents and purposes stone dead but as it says right here at the beginning of the next cycle I shall send them forth again one of the most beautiful things I've ever read of a, a Hindu guru he was writing about the little squirrel who was looking up at the leaf on the tree and says oh I feel so sorry for you and the leaf said why she and the little squirrel said well because it seems like pretty soon you may die. And you'll have to let go from your branch and you'll be no more. And the leaf said, no, it's not true. I know that I shall fall from the branch, but you know what? And the squirrel said, what? And the little leaf said, as I'm falling from the branch, I'll wave to my tree and I'll say, I'll see you soon. Because in the very, very next cycle, as the spring comes, the leaves will return. And this is exactly what, what Krishna is telling you. This is, a, this, is, this is the one thing that Christianity refutes and will not let you hold on to. And this is the thing that frightens and hurts more people when it comes to the question of death. And that is the newness that in the next cycle, then there is a return of every one of you. How many times have you died? How many times have you returned? Always for what reason? To come to the earth and to begin to learn your lesson and to learn your mission. And so that one day, say, as it culminates the grand design, all will have learned of themselves the true nature of what we call God 
and then the planet Earth becomes the planet heaven. And that's, that's the grand design, the grand plan. So look what is being said. And look that this is being said thousands of years before your Bible was written. You see, all beings return at the close of every cycle, and then at the beginning of the next, I shall send them forth again. So you have a cosmic cycle. And this is an interesting point. And everything is in a cycle. And how is your cycle run? It's the nature of a season, the nature of the cosmos. You have a year, you have a month, you have a week, you have a day, you have an hour, you have a second, you have an instant. Everything resolves itself down. See, what you're, what you're experiencing now is a tremendous change in the cycle of the cosmos. What you're experiencing on the Earth is a point where you're about to move from August into September. As you do that, you'll start to see storms forming all over the place. And you'll see the man on the weather or the lady in the weather and she'll be pointing to a chart and we have a depression that's forming here. Why? All of a sudden, because the seasons are changing. And when the seasons are changing, upheaval begins. Okay? Well, that's on the earth. You're changing from August to September and you get your hurricanes and all types of things like that. But in the universe, it's much bigger. And you're changing from Pisces to Aquarius. And there are storms forming all over the place. There are storms forming all over the place because it's a new cycle. It's a new season of the cosmos in the same way that you have a new season of the cycle of the Earth's atmosphere. But, you know, you can't, you can't, well, if somebody's going to pick up the phone and scream the blood of Jesus and, you know, be born again, you, how can you even sit and talk? You can't talk rationally. Uh, it's, oh, the new age has nothing to do with anything. The new age has everything to do with everything in the same way that August has to do with September. Pisces has to do with Aquarius. It's simply a word to identify a change in the makeup of the universe, as these are words to simply identify a, a, a change in the makeup of the Earth's atmosphere. You don't have to call it August and September. wonder if there were no words for August and September. What if they don't exist? Okay, there is no August and there is no September. There's still going to be storms. It doesn't make any difference, see? Because the storms don't depend on the words. The words are just so you can identify them. So if that born-again guy that's screaming over the phone, if he can't deal with this, then erase it. But there's still going to be storms. And that's what's happening all over the place. It's not only storms in the atmosphere, it's storms of consciousness, storms of the mind. And basically, many people who are not flowing with the, with, with the harmony. Did you ever see on, te on TV when the guy will say, there's a jet stream, and they'll show you the jet stream and how it's moving? Basically, that's what you've got to do. You've got to find that jet stream that's within your mind, and you've got to, in your meditation, rise from the lower conflicts of the carnal mind up into that jet stream and flow with nature. Otherwise, it'll beat you up. It'll roll all over you. And, and that's what, that's just what Krishna is trying to instruct you to do. That's why Jesus Christ said, take no thought. That's why Buddha told you about the challenges of your own mind and what you must do in order to find a way of survival. See? Because you're, you're, you, you may be able to change yourself, but you're not going to be able to change what's going on outside. You've got to learn how to adapt to it and flow with it. And that's through your inner meditation. So here in this very, very first sentence, Krishna talks about a cosmic cycle. And, and what happens in the cosmic cycle of life. And he's telling you something that no one in your culture has ever told you. In fact, it's been kept from you. And you've heard a lot of stuff about, you know, you're going to die and you're going to go to heaven. Well, that's true. But this is the point that they fail to tell you. You're alive in your lower mind. You must die to that lower mind and you must go to heaven, which is your higher mind. It has nothing to do with physical death. You just read flesh and blood can have no part. And what did Jesus Christ say? He said, Jesus Christ said, God's the God of the living, not of the dead. Because when you die, you know what you got to do? You got to get back into another woman's womb and get born again. Nobody can do anything with you when you're dead. You got to be alive right here on the earth, and that's when you can be part of life cycles. Dying is, is no good. People die, they have to be born again. That's what, you know, Jesus Christ never told one of his disciples you have to be born again. He looked at the religious guy, had a Bible under his arm big enough to choke a mule. He had all his rules and regulations. And he came up there and says, what must I do? And Jesus took one look at him and says, fuck with you. You've got to be born again. He didn't know what. Why? Because you'll never, ever be able to trust this stuff as long as you've had that stuff drilled into your head. You'll never be able to get away from it. It's, you know how difficult it is to tell somebody Jesus Christ was not crucified? Do you know how difficult that is? 
It's intolerable for a person to think that. But unless you get to the point of being able to think that, you're never going to understand life and nature because you're going to walk around thinking that there is some entity on some planet who could not solve the problems of the world without torturing somebody to death. And if your heavenly father is a torturer, then what do you think the children are going to be? Like father, like son. But once you learn that that which is God is female and male, and that which is God makes puppy dogs and dolphins and flowers and roses and pussy cats and little babies and all nice things and has nothing to do with torturing people to death, then you start to move in a whole higher plane of life. And then you can become one with nature. But until these war gods which we have created are killed, we'll never ever be able to break out of the cycle. I will go over and over. In fact, I don't think, I don't know if you were here. When I, were you here when I was talking about when Mustafa taught us? Okay. I don't think until you ever learn that, and it is the most beautiful wisdom. In fact, we're going to New York Saturday night, and Mustafa promised to be there, and I, I treasure being spending time with this man. He's from Lebanon. And for those of you who weren't here, or maybe have not seen this, he summed up wisdom and logic in this very short way as a Lebanese. And he says, Bill, if you're going to event a god named Jehovah, who is going to order your people to fight and come and steal my land, then I am going to create a God named Allah, and he's going to come and get it back. And until these two war gods are dead, we'll never, ever stop the fight. It's not Jews fighting Arabs. It's Jehovah fighting Allah. And, and, and just understand that. As long as Allah and Jehovah exist, there's always going to be bullets flying. Always. And so they've got to go. And once they're gone, then the universal female and, and mother and father God exists, and then there can be the peace and tranquility that we talk about. See? So there you then talk about, here we have Krishna talking about this cosmic cycle, and we start to learn, okay? It, it's cycling so many things. They're talking about the bats coming out of a cave in, in New Mexico. It's a cycle. They come when it's time to come, and they go back when it's time to go back. How do they know? Because they know. Because they're programmed. How does, how does the little dog know how to give birth? I, I witnessed it when our Gigi gave birth to nine puppies. I was hoping the doctor would be there because I knew that women, you know, when, had to have doctors and everything. I said, how? You know, this is only a dog. dog's not as smart as a woman. <laughs> Boy, was I surprised. And I saw that dog who does no, knew nothing about umbilical cords, knew nothing about sacs, knew nothing about puppies, knew nothing about anything, suddenly become a mother right before my eye. Knew everything about everything. Broke the sack, cleaned the animal, cut the umbilical cord in the proper place. Took all of the puppies to the doctor and said, here they are. The doctor said, there's nothing for me to do. She's done it all. He put a little iodine on that place where the umbilical cord was cut. We returned the puppies to Gigi, and all she did was clean the iodine off. She said, who put that on you? You don't need that. How dare you? And she knew, mother knew best. See? But when I saw that, I realized this is the cycle of nature. This is, this is the cycle that gives instructions to all things and says, this is what you do. And if you and I will only learn to return to that same natural cycle and wait for instructions, we'll know in each circumstance, whether you're having a baby, whether you're coming up against a problem of some kind, you'll know exactly what to do because nature will speak to you from the right side and say, this is the way. It says in the Bible, in the 31st chapter of Isaiah, you'll hear a still small voice that'll say, this is the way. Walk in it when you turn to the left or turn to the right. Rich Hay it comes to church here periodically. He's a pilot. He was flying for TWA. Who's he flying for? I think he's flying for United or Delta now. And Rich, is a, he pilots these big 747s. And he told me one time, he says, you know, when you're talking, he says, when we're bringing, a, we're bringing a plane into a big city, you know, even sometimes he says, I sit there and I know how to fly these things and there's 300 people that I'm carrying in this plane through all kinds of storms. But I don't have to worry because I just set my sight on that beacon and I don't know where anything is, but I just follow that beacon and what do you know, I come right down to the runway and it's perfect landing every time. I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen the runway. I don't even know where it is. I don't know where the city is. How am I taking all of these people? So I follow the beacon. You don't know where anything, you don't know where your life is going. I don't know, but there is a beacon inside of you. And that beacon says, follow me. And you, and you, and you attach yourself to that beacon 
through meditation. That's why it is so, so important. Otherwise, you find yourself. I, 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 I wish I, I didn't erase that. I wish I had saved that fellow screaming over the phone about what goes on here. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And I mean, you could hear it. He was just so caught up in the, in the viciousness of it all, you know. What good is it? Then? So, so everything that is part of an evolution and an involution. That's, there's two words, evolution and involution. Everything comes down, everything goes up, everything goes down, everything goes up, the tide goes down, the tide goes up, the moon is full, the moon is that, ba, 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 everything constantly. And everything that happens outside of you happens inside of you. That's nature. That's law. That's, that's the cosmic law, see? So it's not really creation. It's the constant moving of things so that everything may develop and grow. And, so, and that's why I say we have to grow up. We have to be mature. And we have to understand how nature works. And if indeed, hit, c c let's just stop for a minute. Don't, don't even read anything. Don't even, this is what we've been told as a little child. And, and this is one of the reasons that I considered when I was a little child in school, I was in a religious school, I considered the fact that I was in some kind of prison, so I, I split, I escaped. Okay? Because this is what our teaching is. There is this thing that lives on a planet somewhere called God. This thing could not figure out how to solve the problems of the Earth unless he tortured a young man to death in a most grotesque way, naked, bleeding, ripping to pieces. You know, I didn't like that. I didn't think it was nice. I thought he could have thought of a better way, and I told him that. Then I heard after that that this same thing called God was plotting the next great escapade. He was going to nuclear bomb the Earth, and he was going to wipe out a third of the people, and he was going to call it Armageddon. And I thought of the little children who were going to be burned, and the little puppies and the little sheep, and I thought of the old people. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I don't want to hang around with you because that's not a very nice way. And you created it. And then as I got older, I realized that's wrong. And then when I, when I, when I read about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the, and, and the dying and the blood and all of that, and then I read Joseph Campbell's book where John, in, in the apocryphal Bible of Thomas, John goes into the cave and Jesus is standing there, and it wasn't a crucifixion at all. And Jesus says to John, you know, the things that they're saying about me are not worthy of me because what they say I suffered, I did not suffer. And you know what? They never allowed that in the Bible. I wonder why. So, when we then study the teachings of, of Krishna, we have to realize that the divine personality of God is reflected in the sum total of human life. Say, people say, well, you cannot see God. You've never seen God. All you have to do is turn and look at the person next to you. Say, and once you can rid yourself of the teachings of churches that say, oh, no, you know, he's up on a planet somewhere plotting Armageddon, once you can rid yourself of all that violent teaching, then you can start to understand. By looking at the way mankind acts, we see how far we've evolved towards God. Say, Jesus Christ put it this way, wisdom is known by her children. What are the results of the things that we have seen? Take a look at them. Just look at it. Oh, and it's just, it, it doesn't relate itself strictly to Christianity. It's all the religions, violent religions, because as long as you have a belief that is different than mine, and you want to protect your belief, and I want to protect my belief, we are at odds, and we're going to fight. Sooner or later, we're going to have a fight. See? And Jesus Christ said, that's dangerous. And so what did Jesus say in John 17? Father, I pray they all may be one. Say, so how could you? You have one religion? Yes. What is that religion? No religion. When you have no religion, then you have God. Because then you have that essence of nature, which is within itself. How, how do all the birds and, and all of the little animals run around without religion? Could you ever imagine how they're able to survive without religion? They do. So tonight, uh, and when we're studying Aquarius, and Aquarius is the new cycle in which the evolution moves towards God. It moves towards individuality. It moves towards the love of nature. It moves away from all of this stuff of religion, and that's what Aquarius does. In other words, we come to nature, and we don't know God. We don't understand God. Then we develop, and we become more like God because 
we start to enter into meditation, and then we return more like God, and then we go forth again until finally that goal is we become God. Say, oh, you know. And, and I'll tell you something. In the early days of this church, whenever I said we become God, you'd see people, especially they always sit in the last row because, they, uh, and then they'd start heading to the door. You know, they were always very quiet and very respectful, but you could see they're gone because this is this is foreign. How could you be God? You can be God if you understand the nature of God. And this is what Krishna is trying to teach you today. This is what Jesus Christ tried to teach you. See? You say, well, how could God possibly be God? Can't you see the little caterpillar crawling across the ground through all the dirt and filth and slop and garbage of the gutter and thinking to itself, I am the lowliest of all. I could never amount to anything. And then something draws it to a death. And it enters into a cave, it enters into its tomb, and it is sealed in doom and despair and gloom, the lowest of the low. And then the tomb opens, and it spreads its beautiful multicolored wings, and it flies among the flowers. How could it? But it does. So look at 88.1 in Krishna. The realm of nature, which is part of me. OK? That's very important. The realm of nature, which is part of me. And it all goes back to this. Page 48 in your little Bibles, the book of Exodus. Page 48, the book of Exodus. Chapter 3. Okay. Now the point is, and I would challenge, I, I don't wish to struggle with born-again Christians or anybody else, but nonetheless, the, the book is there, and the book says what it says. And if it says what it says, and if you want to take it literally, fine, I can do that too. So let's go. Let's take it literally. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, Moses is talking to God, and he says in the very last sentence, if they say to me about God, what is his name, what shall I say? And God says to Moses, I am that I am. Who is God? Why don't you, don't you see why it said that? If they ask who is God, what do I say? I am. Now you've stumbled on the secret of the ages. You've stumbled on the secret of the ages. Let me show you something. The letters, the mystical letters of I am that I am are Y-H-W-H. -H. OK? It is the masculine and it is the feminine. It is the mind and it is the spirit, Y-H-W-H. Those are the mystical Sanskrit letters. Now, of course, religion and culture couldn't deal with understanding it. They had to name it. So God became Yahweh. I don't think there's another H in there, but Yahweh. Now, the culture of religion left the East and spread to Europe where Latin was the prevailing source of communication. Well, in Latin, there's no Y. So they replaced it with the I, which is pronounced J. J-H, in Latin, there's no W. It became V-H, and this god, Yahweh, all of a sudden became Jehovah. Completely, completely constructed by culture. Completely constructed by language, but yet, so we have Jehovah, our war god, and Yahweh, our war god, and we've completely neglected the masculine and feminine, I am, I am. And if they ask you, who is God, you say, I am. Now, if we had ever been able to accept that, we would have been on the, the, the movement of what the great writers of mysticism, the Joel Goldsmith and the Emmett Fox and the Hilton Hotimas and and then uh, Helena Blavatsky, and all of these people were trying to get us to understand that which is God is you. Manifest within you is God, if you'll allow it. Universal mind is God. It is me, me, okay. that nature. And so when it says in 88.1 of Krishna, into the realm of nature, which is part of me, we look at that word me, and we begin to understand. That is the name of God, the universal God, I, me. So the leaves, the woman's cycle, all nature. Nature has no mind. Nature, nature has no mind of choice. It, it all, 
it all funnels like through the pineal or the pineal gland of the brain. It, it does what it is programmed to do. Sorry. So somebody said to me not too long ago, you know, I, don't, I, I think you're off base here because what you're saying is basically, uh, you know, everything is provable. So what you're saying is that if you can't prove God, that proves that God doesn't exist. I said, no, no. If I'm saying if I can't prove God, that proves that I don't have the key of understanding. Okay. Because anybody who looks and follows the key can prove God. It's very easy to do. Okay. So now let's get to Jesus Christ. And, and, and Jesus Christ is my teacher, my guru. I listen. I, I study what he says. And this is what Jesus Christ says. Page 869. John chapter 5. Now, you have me, which is the higher part. You have the lower self. Let's try to identify them. You have I, you have I am, you have me, which is the God part. You have the lower self, which is the physical part, okay? What does Jesus Christ say? John chapter 5, verse 30. Now, this is Jesus talking. It's not me talking. It's not some New Age guru talking. This is Jesus Christ talking. What does he say? He says right to you. He talks directly to you. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. I can't do anything. I have no power. It's in the Bible. It's not something I made up. If you have a Bible on your lap and you look at it, you'll see the first words of John 5.30 as Jesus Christ speaking, saying, I can on my own self do nothing. That means he has no skills, no powers, no ability of any kind. All right? That's quite a confession because this is the guy you're told to follow as God. And he's saying, no, <laughs> I'm sorry, you got the wrong guy. So now we go around and we take a look at John the Baptist. John the Baptist starts to talk about a difference. He starts to talk about him as the self. He then starts to relate to Jesus as the higher mind. And he starts talking in, in realms of mysticism such as this, page 866. We're going to do a little Bible jumping for a while because I just want to show you something and then we'll be done. John chapter 3, verse 30, okay? Now here is John talking about the, the self, the higher self and the lower self when he says, he must increase, meaning the Christ nature, the Christ mind, but I must decrease, meaning the lower self. So there's meditation. You must subdue that which is the lower mind. You must allow that which is the higher mind to rise. Okay? Okay. Now go to page, you're on, you're on page 866. Go to page 868, which is John chapter 5 and verse 19. Okay? Here's Jesus once again reaffirming and reinforcing this point. The son can do nothing of himself. Okay. Nothing. This is Jesus talking. A moment ago you heard him say, I can't do anything. Now he's reinforcing that, saying, I can't do anything. The son can do nothing of himself. You can do nothing of yourself because yourself is your lower mind and you frustrate yourself and you frustrate yourself and you frustrate yourself and you try to do what religion says to do and they say, oh, if you say this prayer or if you sign this card or if you recite these beads or if you sing this song and nothing ever happens and you pretend it happens. So you show up every Sunday and you pretend with everybody else that something has happened and even to the point when you're sick and if they pray for you and you're still sick, you won't tell them because you won't want them to think you don't have faith and so you'll snort and snot and snivel outside of the range of where they are because you don't want them to know that it doesn't work. But it doesn't work. Because you can't do it. Nobody can do it. It doesn't work. Look what Jesus, look at, look at, uh, look here on page 868, go to 869. John chapter 5 verse 31. What does Jesus say? If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. What do you have to have the guy do? Does he have to come here and say, it's all a bunch of bull? But well, that's what he just said, didn't he? I mean, they got his picture on Christmas cards and on Easter cards, and they're telling you to invite him into your heart, and they're telling you all of this stuff. And what did he just get done saying? I can't do nothing. I don't know nothing. I'm nothing. Nothing is nothing, and I don't know. And don't ask me. I'm not telling you nothing. I got enough of my own problems. Get the cock out of here. I don't want to hear from you. Why? 
because Jesus Christ said, if you go to the Father, the Father himself will embrace you, and the Father is your higher mind, because Jesus has said, the things that I do, you can do, you can do better. Once you learn the key. I didn't tell you this now. You read it in the Bible. You look at the cover, it says Bible. <laughs> or as they say in the bigger places, the word of God. Now, look what, look, what, uh, look, what, look what Krishna said in 88.1. All beings come into the realm of nature, which is part of what? Part of who? Me. Okay? Now, look at page 869. And didn't you just hear Jesus say, I can't do nothing. I don't know nothing. You don't know nothing. Nothing and nothing is nothing. Nobody knows nothing. So it's not him. But what does he say now? Look at John chapter 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Not him, because he said he's nothing. And then look what he says. And you will not come to me that you might have life. That's, that's, see, that's what I'm saying. We have to grow up and we have to mature. It's very specific that he's not talking of himself or he wouldn't say, I can't do anything. And if I testify myself, my testimony is not. But you must come to me. And that's where you've got to learn the Eastern way. And they use the word I, I am, me to signify the eternal higher realms of consciousness within inside of your head. You must come to me, the I am. Okay? But it says you will not come to me. See? Now watch this. You know, this Jesus is a pretty intelligent guy, reasonably intelligent, and he has a fairly good grasp of the language, and the translators have a fairly good grasp of the English language, and you know, you know how to use it. Now watch something. What is God's name? I am and me. Watch something. And see if you can see it now that you've got a you've got an idea. John chapter 5, you're right where you are. You don't have to move anywhere. And um, and i got to find John chapter 4. Well, I guess I can't find it. Yeah, is that it? If I, do I have the right one? Yes, I do. I'm sorry. I did find it. I did find it. And I, I did. Hey, you know what I do? Isn't it clever how I always test to see if you're paying attention? Yes. <laughs> It is great that you're always paying attention. You're right on the money. John chapter 5, verse 43. Now watch what it says. I am come. Is that the way you say that? I am come? Is he getting a little retarded or what? I don't think so. He knows exactly what it's talking about. Exactly. That's exa yes. Just give me a chance. I'll get to that. Same to you, fellow, I'll tell you that. I am. Come in my Father's name. You receive me not. And that word, Father's name, the word name does not mean name as you have a name. It means way. And the Father's way is meditation, energizing the realms of consciousness. See what it says? I am. Come in my Father's way. You receive me not. But watch this one. What about religion? What about Christianity? What about all the religions? Watch what it says. But if another shall come in his own way, him shall you receive. See? I am come my Father's way, the inner kingdom. You receive me, which Christian was talking about, not. But if another shall come with a new way, you receive it. How many of these people will come to that higher self, the inner way, the me, will under even read Krishna, read Buddha, read this and understand. No, they won't come near it. But yet, we'll make up the story. And I mean the most grotesque stories of torture and killing and rape and pillage. Your Bible, my God, you wouldn't. If, if you had that, they want to have Bible reading in schools. If you had that, if that was a book written by Joe Blow somewhere, they'd be marching on the schools to have it taken out of there. 
because it is filled with violence and sex and rape and pillaging, the degrading of women. The thing is loaded with it. And when you take it literally, that's the way it comes out. Now watch. Go to page 870, John chapter 5 and verse 35. Okay. I, I don't know what I'm doing here, whether I'm getting all of these things uh, screwed up or whatever. I, 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 but anyhow, it, what is it? All right, forget it. The one I'm looking for is, I am the bread of life. He, yeah. Well, then what am I doing here? John chapter 5. John chapter 6, verse 35. That's what I said, and that's what I meant. <laughs> I am the bread of life. Now, what is the bread of life? I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. Now, remember, he that believes on me shall have eternal life. Remember, Jesus Christ has just got done telling you, I can do nothing of myself. I cannot give witness of myself. But now he's saying that the bread of life is I am, the universal me the mind, the I mind, as does Krishna. Now, here's a good description of how people who dwell in the lower cannot touch what we call God. Watch this real closely. You're on page 869. Go to page 872. Now, what happens when you come in here on a Tuesday night? What happens, what happens when people come to church? There's a big difference. When you come in here on a Tuesday night, you come in here on a Thursday night, you go to meditation. You cannot take your thoughts in. They won't go. They're not allowed. That's called the Sabbath. It's the place of the pineal gland. When you enter in, you enter in through the divine self. None of you, none of your mind is allowed in there. You can't go in there. So you just allow yourself to dissipate, the thoughts to dissipate, and you are drawn in by the power of nature, by the power of God itself. Okay? On the other hand, in church and religion, you try to get in by singing a song or saying a prayer or doing something one way or the other. You try, you try, you try. But now look what Jesus Christ says in John chapter 7. Okay? In verse 34, he's talking about dwelling in the right hemisphere of the brain. He's talking about dwelling in that place where thoughts don't exist. And he says, you shall seek me and shall not find me. But where I am, there you cannot come. See? The lower self cannot go where the I am exists. And then you're going to try to find God, and the whole nature of life is trying to find God and trying to prove God and trying to see the reality of God. Never can do it, because it's always tried to be done with the mind. The only one you can ever prove God to is yourself. Never be able to prove it to another person. Each person must find the I am on his or her own merit. Can't be done any other way. I say, why? Why can't I find this? Why can't I use, you know, I am trying to use my mind to find it. And Jesus says, you are in John chapter 7, verse 34 and 872. Turn to page 873, John chapter 8, verse 20, uh, John chapter 8, verse 21. Look what it says. I go my way, you shall seek me and die in your sins. What's the word sin mean? The emotions. Who is sin? Sin is the moon god, which means the emotions. You shall die in, in, in the bondage of your own emotional nature and all of the fear and all of the guilt and all of the fright. For where I go, you cannot come. How come? Look at verse 23. You are from beneath. I am from beneath. Above. You are of this world, this mind. I am not of this world. You see? You've got to get out of your emotions. You've got to get out of your mind. You've got to get out of the physical aspects. And you've got to lift yourself above that which is the world, which is the lower mind, into that place where there is absolute nothingness. Then you'll know. And you'll never be able to explain it to us all. Never. I, uh, I had this experience. Oh, sure you did. Yeah, OK. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, maybe you ought to take a drink of water or something, or lay off the pasta or something like that. Okay. You are from beneath. I am from above. 
So what are we talking about? What are we talking about this Jesus? What are we talking about Moses? What are we talking about all of these ancient patriarchs? What are we talking about all these Bible scholars? What are we talking about all of this stuff? Look at page 874, John chapter 8, verse 58. Here's the crowning statement. I'm saying unto you, before Abraham was I am. That Jesus Christ has just got done telling you, that's not me I'm talking about. Don't be, I'm not talking about me. Look at here. Ha, ha, ha. Not me. My nose is running. I got an itch in the back. All of this stuff. It's not me. I had the same problem you do. Got indigestion. I ate too much. Is that a Mexican food? I'm burping. What? I'm telling you this. I'm not saying don't follow me. Nothing. I'm talking about I am. And once you know I am, and you can say, I am one, I am God, then you rise into that place that you cannot go with the mind, but that your spirit is taken and scooped up by the bosom of God and taken into that higher, beautiful place. I am as I am. See? Now, when we go back to the I, this is the I. This is the source of life. I am. See? I is, is the universal aspect of your divine mind. Now go with me with just a few more scriptures. Go to page 875, John chapter 10, verse 30. Okay? Maybe you want to, uh, did that click off in there? Okay, you've got to put that back on, just on pause and record. Okay? You've got to go to John chapter 10 and verse 30. What does it say? I and my Father are one. Okay? The supreme, don't you, for God's sakes, in the, you don't even have to go anywhere. You don't have to pay anything. Here, how close can it be between your ears, in between your nose and the back of your head, between your chin and the top of your head is God. And you're going to the crystal cathedral and this cathedral and the tabernacle and the temple all over the place. And here it is in the middle of your head. Closer than your breath and I lost my place. <laughs> yeah. That's all right, so you wait. <laughs> John 10.30. I know I'm John 10.30. I lost it. Okay. Now, now, now watch this here. Now watch this here. A lot of times when people say, hey, I have this power, you know, they come in. As soon as they say, I have this power, say, you know, whoo, blow away, get, get away, because uh, you know, this, that's, that's an emotional problem they have. Okay? This is what I want you to see. John chapter 6. Go to page 871. John chapter 6, and look at verse 65. And what does it say? Therefore, I said unto you, no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And it is I and the Father were one. In other words, you cannot come into that part of your head, that part of your mind, unless it is on the terms of nature. It has got to be a separation from human thought, and then you are consumed in, it is God that comes and gets you. Now, it's not a question of you meditating, because meditating is not something you do. Meditating is something that happens when you're doing nothing. It is nature that will sweep you up. You can do nothing about it. The divine me opened that inner impulse, okay? When they asked, you, a lot of times you say, well, who is the Father? Who is God? What is God? Where is God? And we, we've learned about me this morning. And look what Jesus says on John chapter 14, page 880. John chapter 14 and these are good to see, you know. John chapter 14 and verse 7. What does Jesus Christ said? If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. If you had known, if you had meditated, if you had entered in, and if you had learned me. Because it says, look at two verses later. He's saying to Philip, have I been with you so long? And it's sometimes I get frustrated. As have I said so much? Have I taught so much? Have we shared so much that you still don't understand? And then Jesus says, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Then what are you saying, show us the Father for? 
It's you! Look in the mirror! See how he did it. How frustrated he got. That's why he said, kill me, get it over with, hey. Don't ever, uh, get me out of here. Real quick, look at 88.2. With the help of nature, this is the next step of me. Again and again, I pour forth the whole multitude of beings, whether they will or not, for they are ruled by me. It doesn't, I had, I've talked to people and said, you're going to come back in a new life. I don't want to come back in this whole life again. I don't. Is that what I, it's like the lady that gave me the finger last week. And I, I remember John and I went to car. We come out the wrong exit, you know. So I'm sitting there. So the person had to make a turn a little to get in. And, and here was this lady. She was a lady. <laughs> what is this? I'm out for a Sunday with my wife. We're driving. Is this nice? What? Here somebody gives you the finger. Why? Because I'm parked in the... I mean, you know, she's freaking totally, completely out. So I said, she's going to come back. And what if she doesn't want to come back? She's had a horrible experience. You can see it. Who wants to come back to this? But you know what Christian just says? You're coming back whether you want it or not. Because you're going to come back again and again and again until finally you don't give the finger, you give peace. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the wrong driveway. You say, that's okay. I understand. Don't worry about it. It'll be nice. Yeah, but that one's Sit down. <laughs> but I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I said, yeah, Bill, but that was cause and effect. It was cause and effect is right. And the cause was me, and the effect was uh, the fingers. <laughs> okay, real quick. I don't want to get that. See, people say they're not sure. But here it says they are ruled by, so it's a cosmic law. The sun goes up. The sun, you could say, uh, excuse me, uh, this is August. I love the summertime. I'd prefer not to have February. My church doesn't believe in February, you know, so it's going to happen anyhow. It doesn't make any difference. It's the same cosmic law that works inside of you. It's not ruled by your will. 88.3, these acts of mind do not bind me. I remain outside and unattached. Me is eternally the same. Constant day or night. Constant. It doesn't make any difference where you go. You can go to this church. You can go to that church. You can practice this religion. You can practice that religion. That which is me, the I am, will always be consistent and in the same place. It doesn't depend. It'll always be separate and aloof from all the whims and all of the ideas and all of the emotions of man and all of his writings and all of his religions. 88.4, under my guidance, nature produces all things movable and immovable. Thus it is, o Arjuna, that this universe revolves. Isn't that beautiful? It just doesn't make any difference. It, it's only incumbent upon us to learn of it. We can't change it. We can't force it to do what we want it to do. We'll either flow in a harmony with it, or it will grind us up. And, and in many instances, that's what it does. 88.5, fools disregard me. Now watch this. Listen to this. Watch it. Look at it closely. I know it's a little long, but we're just um, almost done. Fools disregard me, seeing me clad in human form. Don't you see? Look at each other. Look at each other. You're all human beings. But you know what? Krishna is saying they don't realize they're looking at God because they're looking at a person in human form and they say, oh, that can't be. Surely this isn't. <laughs> but you know what? Krishna is saying, yes, it is. But you'll never, and you never recognize God because you have religion to tell you to look at some, something somewhere on a different planet. And so you disregard the truth of what God is, because you can't deal with God being clad in a human form. Do you see it with your own eyes? This is 7,000 years old. Fools disregard me, seeing me clad in human form. But look what it says. They know not that in my higher nature I am the Lord God of all. Not in your lower nature, in your higher nature. And you can look in the mirror, and when you look in the mirror, <coughs> I know sometimes you get up in the morning, it's going to be a little hard to believe, but nonetheless, that's it. That's God. That's, just, that's the best you're going to get. And isn't that a magnificent and wonderful thing to realize that you don't have to go looking for a God somewhere, that that God dwells right there inside of you? I am. Jesus taught the, the disciples of reincarnation and about... John the Baptist. In 85.5, it says, Fools disregard me, seeing me in human form. They know me not. That's what Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said, They know him not. 
Would you, I know it's late and I'm, and I'm, I'm almost done, but would you just look at that with me for just a second? And I'll, I'll have you out of here in a couple minutes, I promise you. Matthew chapter 17. You see where Krishna said, they know me not clad in human form? Look at Matthew chapter 17. Look at verse 10, okay? And, and the disciples asked him, they said, why do they say Elias must come? And Jesus answered and said, Elias truly should come. But I say to you that Elias has already come, and they knew him not. Verse 13, and the disciples understood he spoke about John the Baptist. In other words, what he was saying is Elias reincarnated in the body of John the Baptist, but nobody can ever accept that. What you and me and the rest of the world has to understand is Jesus Christ, Buddha, and Krishna have reincarnated into the bodies of us, and they know them not. 88.6 of Krishna, real quick. Their hopes are vain. Their actions worthless. Their knowledge futile. They are without sense. They are deceitful. They are barbarous and godless. Why? Because they don't understand God in human form. They don't understand when they look at you and you look at them, you're looking at God. That's the only thing God is. You say God blew himself in billions and billions of parts, and each one of us is a part. And each one of us is God. Because they deny the kingdom within, they deny the Christ in you, they deny God in human form. And Jesus Christ said, the Father abides in you. 88.7, but the great souls are Arjuna, filled with my divine spirit, they worship me. They fix their minds on me and me alone, for they know that I am the imperishable source of being. And he concludes it by saying, always extol... Now, before I, before I read that, go to page 880. Just put your finger in there, because that's... Oh, my God, I ripped it. Just go to page 880. <coughs> put your finger in there. Don't read it, okay? Put your finger on verse 9. Don't read it, okay? Now, I'm going to read, read together with me what Krishna says in, in 88.8. Always extolling me, strenuous, firm in their vows, prostrating themselves before me. They worship me continually with concentrated devotion. Now go to 14.9 where it says from Jesus Christ, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Thank you very much for sharing this time in the Bhagavad Gita. It was good to, to have you. What? What was that last? Um, Here now, Ethel, you're not even off the boat yet. Back from your vacation. John, John chapter 14, verse 9. I said, I said, John, did I say that? What did I say? Well, you had the page. Well, you had the page. Well, that is it. Well, what, isn't it? It's, it's John. Wait a minute. Hold on, everybody. Don't close that down. Yes, I did. And I just think it's totally out of line for Ethel to come back here because she's had three weeks of luxuriating with her. Don't pay attention to them, ladies and gentlemen. Just we'll go on about our business. Thank you very much.